introduction. The talk is going to suck in comparison, so thanks really, Phoebe. Uh, this sounds like it's got a little feedback. Yes? Maybe? No? Tiny bit? Yes, in the back? All I've got is this. So it's, is that OK? It's OK? Great. So first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this chance to be with you, um, to be with an audience that I didn't know who was coming, but it turns out I have family here. Thank you guys for coming very much. Uh, other family in the Forest Service with whom I've worked for decades, uh, former students who are here. Um, and I don't know who the rest of you are, but you're lovely and wonderful. And you know, let's get together somehow. Um, what I'm going to talk a bit about today, um, in part because um, Patty came up with this really nifty title, um, which also puts me in something of a bind. I'll have to, I'll have to um, hold on, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be right with you. <laughs> Technical difficulties. All right. So we're going to talk about the title first. Again, this is Patty's genius to set me up. Um, which is to say, I'm not sure I can do all of these magical things like rescuing not just the West, but the nation <laughs> in 45 minutes, but I'll give it a shot, right? Because this is like really important. Um, saving ourselves from ourselves, that actually might be possible, so we'll, we'll, we'll try that also. Um, but essentially what I'm going to try to talk about is why, as an historian, I've done some of the things that, that Phoebe has suggested. Um, as an historian, on the one hand, and also as a resident of places, um, as a citizen of various communities, uh, that I've learned an enormous amount by the very fact of trying to write my way into them, um, and also to participate in their civic life. Um, and so I'm going to play with some of these notions, because, in part because for historians, um, we have a very simple conceit that the past matters. I don't know if that's actual true, but that's what we think. And it also comes with cautionary tales or cautions uh, in terms of that process, which is if the past matters to what end, to what purpose, to what degree, and if you take that notion as, as many of us have tried to do to go into the policy making arena, whether city government, county, state, or even at the national level, um, then it gets even more complicated because the problems that we might see, that a policy might, maker might say, that's a problem, and we need to fix it, and so therefore we're going to do X, Y, or Z to fix that problem. And a historian might actually step back and say, is it a problem? Who's defining the problem? Is the problem only being defined because the person has defined it? Is it actually real? You can see why we don't get asked out a lot, um, <laughs> right? That, it's, that, that you just start asking more and more questions, and it complicates the process. And I, I have been in rooms where I've done that, and it's like the looks are daggers. Like, shut up. Um, and, but, but I think there's health in that. There's a, a sort of healthy way of, of thinking about it, because I think we also ask the right questions. Whether we have a clue about how to answer them is another issue. Um, but I think those questions matter in large part because they're not asked by other people. That's the conceit I think I bear, which is that at least when I walk into a room um, at a county supervisor's meeting and they're starting to talk about flood control or fire issues or the like, that I've got enough experience watching them work that I can say, um, okay, fair, but can we talk about the past that led up to this moment um, not because I'm an historian, but because we actually can't understand the question they're asking without knowing some of this context. And I'm going to, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do that to you right now. Um, and I want to do it in four ways. So we're going to talk about context. We will talk about contingency. We'll talk about um, patterns and end up with interpretation, because those are among the sort of quivers in our, in our Quivers in our tool chest? No, that doesn't work. What is it? Arrows in a quiver, tools in a whatever. Um, I mean, those are some of the languages that we use when we start to think about an historical event, which we, I think, can actually transpose onto the to contemporary issues um, that might give us some play. So we have in the room people who stood up foolishly, because Patty told you to. You know, you could have said no who understand something about forest management, 
um, and in ways that I want to play with the notion of context in which I've been lucky enough to do um, through a variety of uh, formats uh, within the agency, the Forest Service itself, is to start at the present day. This is a thing that came off of the smoky wire, um, a public policy sort of venue um, that raised an issue this September as a question. The question, and this is what historians do, who should be in charge of America's ancient forest, industry, or environmentalists? Ah, somebody says both. Before I even asked you what you thought, you shot it out. What a great student. What else? Neither. Thank you, Rick Cables. But if it's both or neither and neither, what's the problem with the question? Someone needs to be in charge. How? Let's go to the or in the sentence. What's the problem with or? It's a false dichotomy, which we learn. It's a false dichotomy. It could be those things, but it also could be 15 others. Right? If you say either or, you're saying it's only one of two things. And then there's the wonderful subtext of America's ancient forests set against the backdrop, which is what? Clear cut. Oh. So, Phoebe, unpack this photograph. You're in the audience now. Oh, you watch yes, of course I do. <laughs> so what's the tension between the photograph and the text? Well, it's too late for that place Interesting, too late implies it can never recover because it's Oregon, it's a temperate rainforest, it probably can recover, yes. But hold on that. Ancient forests, probably not. But it's a loaded term. And we haven't even started anywhere. We're just dealing, see, this is why historians are problems. <laughs> Because we haven't even gotten anywhere and we're just, st we're not stalling because it's in fact what we do. We look at things and ask about the context and you start pulling apart the words and asking what the words mean and then you wonder what, what was the point? But that is the point, right? That everything comes in certain ways by which we can begin to analyze them. And I want to choose this notion that that clear cut is a problem and because it has a context. And I want to use other photographs that help us understand the context in which this image is played. And I want to give you a photograph taken um, in the latter part of the 19th century. Actually, 1910. Take it back. First part of the 20th century. Of a clear cut that was done in Michigan in 1860. So 50 years later, this photograph was snapped. What didn't happen? It didn't regenerate. Why did they take the white pine out? It's Michigan. It's what they had. For houses, right? So it went into the economic system. It went to the marketplace. It did whatever the wood was going to do there, railroad ties, homes, whatever. What was the presumption when they took it down and sluiced that, water, that, that timber into a marketplace? What was going to happen to the land? Grow back either as timber or agriculture, right? So it was a land conversion project to flip it from one thing to something else. What did it flip back into? Well, now, sure. Thank you, Hadley. But then, nothing. Hold on that idea. We now come to the great state of Colorado. Clear-cut photograph taken in 1915. The year is as important. The year is important, but no, no. Colorado. The last one was in Michigan. Where? I think it's the Pike. I'm not possible. I'm not pro positive. Maybe Leadville. Thank you. Even better. More site-specific. Thank you very much, Dave Svenke. So, what do your eyes go to? Why erosion? Oh, nice. Subtle. Why erosion? 
What happens when the, the soil erodes? What's the system is gone. It will actually grow back. This does and has and will. But it's going to take something to make that possible. So then the second question is, why were these photographs taken? In the early part of the 20th century, what are, who are they speaking to? What's their audience? And what is being asked of that audience as a consequence of these photographs? Historians? Say that again? And how does this help establish the National Forest System? Excellent. By saying, whoops, it didn't grow back. It's in trouble. We're looking at the erosion. And do keep in mind, the second one is 1915. Why might that photograph have a real resonance to that audience in 1915? World War I. And the photographs of the trench warfare looks exactly like this. There's, and I don't know that it's deliberate, but I'm reading into this photograph that moment. Because it took 70 years for Eastern France to recover. It's a long time. And so this photograph is saying, I think, we have to act. Well, who's going to act? It helps to know who took the photographs. I don't know the particular photographer, but I can tell you who that person worked for. U.S. Forest Service. So why does the Forest Service send its rangers out with cameras in the early part of the 20th century to photograph absolutely every single destructive energy like this that they could find? And there are thousands of these in the National Archives. Oh, well, that's actually great. So this is a peacetime for thing. But, but it's basically to get a budget to do the work that the agency was being designed to produce. It's a way to legitimize your work and then to walk down the halls of Congress and say, see, we told you so. We need more people on the ground. We need more money into the budget. We need, we need to do our job. This is our job. The agency's job was to regenerate landscapes and by its origin stories, in, including legislation, its first job was water, not timber, water, which is why you can't do timber here anyway, so you might as well go after water and protect watersheds is its essential first task, which is crucial because these photographs are embedded in the origins of this agency as a counter attack to clear cutting of an earlier generation or generations. Hold on that. Because this is also Humboldt County, same idea, same imagery, same end result, different context, but in the end works equally. And then you jump 50, 60, 70 years earlier to the Bitterroot Mountains and the Bitterroot National Forest and what would be dubbed the Oh My God Clear Cuts enacted in the late 60s, early 70s. In and of itself, that doesn't look all that different from the earlier photographs, only this is stuff that the Forest Service is doing. And from the internal structure of the organization, this is as good, in a way, as the earlier ones, because what's the end result? Of the timber, at least goes into the marketplace post-World War II to depress the price of timber, of lumber, to build all of the subdivisions that Denver embraces, that Los Angeles embraced, that Boston, I mean, the White Mountain National Forest, parts of it looked like this. The Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Vancouver, Washington looked like this. Lots of places looked like this. But this became the flashpoint or one of two major flashpoints. The other um, is the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. And it was a flashpoint in part, not simply because of the cutovers that happened, but the response of turkey and squirrel hunters when they walked into landscapes that looked like this and couldn't find the squirrels and couldn't find the turkeys. They had used these national forest lands as common grounds for heritage hunting, for sustenance, and they were not happy that the agency had clear-cut those habitats which drove out the animals on which they ate, that they fed. And so what they did, like any good 
citizen was to speak to the representatives when the representatives essentially said we're legislators in West Virginia, this is a federal thing, you need to start finding other places to go and talk with the congressional representatives who were okay with what they were saying and what their concerns were, but they said, you know what the best idea is? Go talk to Ed Cliff. They didn't name him, but go talk to Ed Cliff, the chief of the Forest Service. And in his oral history taken in the 1980s, that's now available at the Forest History Society, he was asked about this, and this is pulled from his oral history. What he said to them was, your interest is not my interest. Your specific desires are not the national concern. So thank you very much, but there's the door. In and of itself, it's a little tone deaf to be generous. But what happened has still, is still reverberating, internal to the agency and external in terms of the world that happened. But here's one of the things that happened. Those hunters sued the agency in federal court. The agency lost in federal court. And what it basically did was to shut down all clear cutting everywhere so it turns out the squirrel hunters were right that their special interest was in the national interest. The courts agreed with them. And the legislative response that happens, as the headline, subheadline says, only Congress can change the Origin Act, the original act of 1891 and 97. Um, it had to go to Congress. They had to rewrite legislation. So the National Forest Management Act, which came out, then begins to determine how these landscapes would be managed and on what bases. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act um, also comes out essentially at the same time. And one of the most crucial elements of that act is that all decisions by this agency and all land management agency must include public comment. The public has to be engaged. Because the agency, as the chief had said, basically, we're the experts, you're not, and we will decide what's going to be right or wrong for these national forests. Well, right, anyway. Um, not you. And what Congress articulated to the agency through not just these two particular acts, but actually starting with the Wilderness Act of 1964 and running through Clean Water, Clean Water, Air Acts and, and the like, Endangered Species and the like, is that the former regulatory agency, the Forest Service, like the Park Service, like BLM, like Fish and, Man Fish and Wildlife Service, they will now be regulated by the legislative branch. That is a huge 180 degree turn in terms of what their role was. And I'm not saying solely that Ed Cliff was responsible, but one of the things I do in, in leadership training with the agency is say, look, this didn't just happen. This was a human voice making a statement that then has reverberated. And so let me ask our colleagues from the Forest Service, what's the most, um, what do most agency employees do most of the time in terms of their work? What's the all-consuming nature of their work? Jim? NEPA. It's a four-letter word in every sense of the word because they spent most of their, NEPA, so the National Environmental Policy Act, to comply with its regs is consuming enormous amounts of time in the agency. And I'm not going to blame Ed Cliff for all of this, but there is a line in which you can go. Here is a single decision that has continued to manifest itself in front of every computer screen and every ranger office on every district and supervisor office for the last 50 years. Human agency is really powerful, and if we only think systemically that there's a system, we miss the input of human beings and the decisions that they make that are consequential for good or ill. So what about contingency? Shifting grounds. This is the Almost Dam, a postcard of the Almost Dam, a flood control retention dam in the city of San Antonio a city that has been blown apart by floods since the city was constructed in the late, 
early 1700s. It was built in a flood basin, which if I could go back to the Spanish, like I wish if I could go back to Ed Cliff, I would say, don't do this. This is going to bring ruin to the community periodically. Uh, but I don't have that power to sail back there and talk to uh, the good missionary fathers about why they picked life inside um, a floodplain. Um, but it did, and they did. And so the question is, that dam. The most important, prob probably the most important public works project that the city enacted um, has two has histories to it, two contingencies that play off of one another. Uh, and so I'm going to actually, in this subject, I'm actually going to go backwards in time so that you can see some of the consequences of placing a dam where it did. So the dam is south of here. This is 2002 flood. This is US 281, major north-south, the only major north-south arterial through the city which periodically goes underwater when water backs up against the flood retention dam. So the dam saves the downtown and puts the freeway underwater. Genius. <laughs> the joke in Texas is, well, it was surely designed by someone who was an engineer from Texas A&M, which in Texas gets a laugh. <laughs> You may be slower, but it's sort of like Colorado State, I don't know, Colorado School of Mines, something like that. Um, and probably it was, but it raises some really interesting issues about choices that earlier generations made for understandable reasons that subsequently the city blew past the boundaries where life wasn't to go into places that now will flood because of the dam that actually aren't in the floodplain exactly. We lived about a half a mile away from here, but on a little higher ground. Um, and neighbors would take their kayaks out and paddle around in what we called Lake Olmos. Um, and indeed, in this time, one of my neighbors sort of crossed the freeway and a cop arrested him for being a public transit on a highway. Seriously. I'm not kidding. I, you know, like he's like, I'm kayaking. It's underwater. No one can drive on it. Um, but that didn't matter. So in 18, 1998, same thing happened. You're beginning to see a pattern here. Um, and in, I've got this shot from the 1960s. Same thing happened. You could go through this city's history and find the moment at which that dam continually backs water up onto highways, making them impassable, though saving downtown. And the only really good intervention I ever did in my life was when a friend who wanted to live not far from here asked me if she should buy the house. It was $60,000 less than this other house that was about 250 feet higher than that one. She said, I really want to save the money. And I said, I want to save your life. I swear to God, I said that. Six months later, she bought the higher elevation house. Six months later, the house that she would have bought went under 12 feet of water had to be torn down, logically, because the water was there for three weeks and just rotted out the foundations and that was that. And I felt so smart. <laughs> really, I mean, it was like, that was the one moment when I could say, okay, nice, did, you, good, did a good job. Well, so why did they build the dam if that's sort of the upstream consequence of doing so? And there we get to the sort of subtext here, or the larger text, which is if they hadn't built it downtown, and this is one of the major streets, Houston Street, that runs east-west, repeatedly had gone underwater year after year after year. This is 1921. It was a major flood, and I'm working on a book. I swear to God, I am working on it. Um, and it has to be due at the end of next summer, uh, because if I want to get it centennial, um, it has to be done then. So it may be. And then this is from 1913. So to stop that, they built a dam. But as with all policy making, the question has to be, when you build a dam or any kind of infrastructure, who does it help and who does it not help? And in this case, well, it took away a pool for these guys. Um, but, but in truth, it helped the downtown core survive. All good. It actually transformed San Antonio as a place. The moment the dam went in, uh, venture capital came in and it started to build skyscrapers because it couldn't do it before because why would you invest in a floodplain that actually flooded? You wouldn't. But after that happened, so that occurred. 
Uh, the city came up with a nifty idea prior to that moment, but only could be implemented once the dam was built, of creating the San Antonio River Walk, which is now the behemoth in terms of generating income for the city. And, and if you haven't been there, it's a remarkable space, one of the best pedestrian landscapes in the United States, if not the single best. Um, and generates billions of dollars for the community. So one looks at the dam and goes, OK, not bad. But it turns out in the 1921 flood, nobody died downtown. Nobody died anywhere in the space between where the dam was built and the downtown that went underwater. Where they died was on the west side in the Latinx neighborhoods that were poor and immiserated, uh, underemployed, and brutal landscapes. That's who died. And this dam does nothing for them. And the community knew about their misery, knew absolutely about their despair, and understood that those creeks that ran through those neighborhoods, in fact, carried more water than the San Antonio River. No one anticipated that was possible, but it was. So in choosing to build and to protect the downtown economic interest, which again is a logical thing to do, and spend $4 million on that dam, what they conceded by spending $6,000 on the east side was that it did not matter and would not matter until the 1970s when Latino politicians driven by a female organized group called COPS, Communities Organized for Public Services, took over the public arena, demanded social change, uh, and got it in extraordinary quick fashion um, and made San Antonio a very different place as drainage and, and flood control now moved to the west side where their grandparents had died or at least had been disrupted out of their lives. So contingency, that is who gets what and who doesn't, and if we can see multiple things simultaneously and hold them at the exact same moment as that dam helps us see even as it bridged across a valley, it's the connecting device between the landscapes that would be developed and those that would remain undeveloped. It helps us understand, again, what historians can bring to the table uh, when we start to talk about those issues and the third sort of subheading about pattern sort of plays with fuels and fire and what we mean by both of those terms. As Coloradans in the 2010s knew, and as Southern California knows, 12 months of the year, fires burn a lot of things, including houses and full subdivisions. And what we're seeing now, as this photograph helps us begin to recognize, is that the fire is not a wild thing any longer. It's a structural thing. And that we're building fuel by building houses. And that begins to shape the dynamic in certain ways. But it turns out that has a history also. And I'll use Los Angeles as a way to sort of tell this story, but I suspect you could tell it in the front range. You can certainly tell it um, in lots of places around the West um, that have been built into what we call the wildland urban interface. It's a really clunky term, and it implies systemically that it's just a thing. Keep in mind, it's a political development that makes this possible. Well, in the 1950s, the Hollywood Hills burned right after they were developed. In the early 1960s, Bel Air burned. Please note what burned and what didn't. There's a famous picture from this fire of Richard Nixon standing on his roof, because he lived up here, holding a garden hose, trying to hold off a fire. Very different history would have erupted had he not survived. <laughs> Just saying. Just, you know, contingencies, right? In the 1970s, subdivisions that buffered up into the San Bernardino foothills in Riverside and San Bernardino City were torched. And I could give you every decade multiples of these same photographs. Uh, yeah, this one from 2008. It's the Sayre Fire in Silmar, California. Uh, it was the second fire of that year. 
We've just had the fourth fire run through the exact same neighborhood. Now four fires in 11 years have blown through the same area. And when I say blown, I mean the winds just howl through there and burn out everything. These manufactured homes sat off of the highway, US uh, 281, uh, Interstate 281, two, uh, 210, excuse me, for about seven years as these sort of ghastly monuments to the fire's past and fire's future because it burned again this year. In 2009, and I absolutely adore this photograph, uh, it's the station fire that erupted in the Angeles National Forest, um, burned about 150,000 acres, um, and was kind of a monster. It was fascinating to watch, I have to say, from the outside, not fighting it, but it was absolutely fascinating to watch the infrastructure of firefighters. Uh, we were in a hotel because our house was being renovated and we were just watching streams of helicopters fly past us um, that were going to take this out and, and 727s that had been converted to drop uh, retardant. Um, it took them a month to even corral this monstrous fire. Um, but why I love this photograph is it tells a huge story. So unpack this, Phoebe, and the rest of you. What's going on here? People are sightseeing. This is Los Angeles. It's all theater. But what are they sitting on? A car? Yep. And in front of them, all those lights in the San Gabriel Valley? People are going about their lives as the world seems to be falling apart. It's entertainment on the one hand, but we're also looking at that car and those lights, the electricity and the fuel that is in fact fueling through climate-driven processes, these very fires. It's, you start playing with these things, and I don't think I'm projecting too much. It looks like hell, it is hell. Um, and it's apocalyptic in a way that I think is really kind of fun, except that these guys are just sitting there going, oh, this is very interesting. It's like a TV screen for them. The Latuna fire in 2017, to take a look at where the fire was and how it was fought, is to notice another pattern that's absolutely essential, and I'll pick it up in a, in a moment. But note the red lines that roam around it. The interstates are the key to subdivision development in places that burn. The electricity that flows along those interstates are, as we now know for the last decade, at the source of most fires in California. As the winds come howling through the passes where the electric lines are also being run by Southern Cal Edison, Pacific Gas and Electric, and San Diego Pacific Gas and Electric, they snap. And when those wires go into the chaparral and they explode, you get fires of this massive quality that also highlight the built landscape that made those fires possible and you take the Saddle Ridge Fire, which is again the most recent one in Silmar, and you look at that sort of the urban geography of fire in Southern California, it's framed around the very landscape that we have hammered into the ground. Suburbs have to have electricity. I don't doubt that. I mean, I have a house in one of them. But it also means that we're utterly implicated and the very things that, that disrupt our lives. Um, and you can see how it rolled down through these areas and jumped freeways. Um, fires are really good at jumping freeways, despite everyone's thought that that's a great fire break. It could be a 16-wide freeway, and it still jumps it quite easily. Um, and that's, that's a problem um, in, in ways that are really crucial. So the fourth thing that historians do is interpret. As Anna knows, my favorite two words in the world are so what? Why does it matter that any of this is true? And I think the so what, or the response to the so what, as an interpretive mnemonic device, is to start to see what, in fact, we can do as a polity, um, and maybe historians can help us see. So, for example, in the fire and flood issues, um, because I lived both in San Antonio and now in Los Angeles, I've been very lucky um, <laughs> that people wanted to hear what I say, the fools. Um, but I was on the phone today, and I will just, like, this is, this is not a humble brag, it's just a brag. <laughs> 
that I was on the phone today with Business Week and um, the LA Times because now what they want to know is not what happened, but the so what. Like, what do we do? And thankfully, I have an answer. Um, and it actually is the connection between San Antonio and LA and what I observed in one place that I think applies to the other. In the late 1990s, after decades of flooding and billions of dollars being ejected into the ground to make San Antonio flood safe, not proof, but safe, the county in which San Antonio sits, Bejar County, had had enough. And it collaborated, which it never does with the city. And it collaborated with the River Authority, which it had never done. And they came up with a half a billion dollars to do multiple things, which is to build more flood control and flood retention dams all over the place, because it's got a thousand miles of river inside this county. But the really cool thing they did was to offer homeowners living in the flood pain a buyout. They are buying up houses and have been doing so for the last decade. There's now a wait list because nobody wants to live in a floodplain if you have an option. And the option is to buy you at market rates, to get you out of there, tear down the house, and then turn these rivers that run linearly through the city into parks. So you take the river, which is dangerous, and you turn it into recreation space, which brings people back to it. It's absolutely brilliant. So I was there when it happened. I'm going, oh, this is a great idea. This is a great idea. I moved to Los Angeles. Wait, 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 wait. Why not transfer that same argument? Um, and so one of the things I have suggested, not that anybody cares, sadly, is that what if we did the same thing in California? A fire and flood bond, because those two things come together. In 2017, the Thomas Fire took out over 260,000 acres in Ventura and Santa Barbara County. Two weeks later, a storm dropped nine inches of rain on some of the most badly burned areas of that region and just tore through Montecito and killed lots of people who had evacuated for the fire, were told to evacuate for a flood. Some of them got out and lots of them didn't. And their houses were buried under 10 feet of mud. Well, if you could go back in and, you know, 10 minutes earlier say, would you like us to buy you out? That would be an option. Um, it's going to cost a lot because Southern California's overheated market is overheated, and therefore you're going to have to have billions of dollars to do this. But I would much prefer to save people at an enormous cost than to have to rescue them time after time after time. If Silmar is going to burn four times, why shouldn't it burn 10? And every time, and I've gone through the records, like every time 100,000 people run away, which means every freeway, if it is not closed by the fire, is choked with people trying to get away from the fire. That's really expensive. So what if we proactively solve some of that problem? And I think that matters a lot. But it also matters if we look at this photograph from the NRDC about, about global warming. Unpack this one. What's the, what are they conveying? Sunset. Yeah, so one there, I mean, you can't see it because somehow in my clipping, I clipped off the, the, the wind farms, right? But the apocalypse is here. Although maybe the salvation is in that word turbine, maybe. But as my colleagues and I um, think about those issues and the declensionist narrative that drives them, the fact that the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and that's hell, is problematic also. And as a teacher, uh, for the last decade, I and my colleagues have been talking about one of our colleagues, a former CU faculty member, Ann Davis, describes as the blue, uh, green blues. We're really good at playing the downbeat and the despairing and the destruction 
It's so easy and so fun. But when I look at my 18-year-olds in a classroom, the fun sort of evaporates because I'm describing their future, not mine. One of the things I really hate is I'm going to be dead by the, you know, whenever it happens. But I am not getting to the end of this century when that's going to happen. And I really am just despairing because I'd like to see the world in the latter part of the 21st century to see how we've done. But if what I want to see is how we've done, then I can't leave it here in my classroom, in my public debates and, 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 and conversations. Um, and so this is going to be terribly self-referential, but it's a really cool text. There has to be a point at which we talk not simply about the devastation of the present and well into the future, but whether we actually have agency. We do. But we have to have the tools to figure that process out. And here's where historians, again, can step into the conversation. This is a collection of um, articles, chapters, um, that I'm really proud to have helped edit and bring into the world. Because we gave activists and historians and political scientists and policymakers a really important charge. And I said, look, I want you to write this for my students, to my students. And I want you as historians, people who think about the past, to think about the past where we have made a difference, even if only partially. And that's really important. Nobody works in policy or any arena with complete data. And if we wait for complete data, we'll, we're still waiting. You have to act with what you've got. And it may be inimical, ultimately. You may make mistakes. In fact, you will make mistakes. You have to go into that process knowing that it's going to be imperfect. And it's in that imperfection that we know we're human. That's not necessarily a great thing, but it's true. But you also have to act. And so the chapters range all over the place from the southern border, um, uh, uh, looking at Portland and various ways by which it has tried to restore its waterways and also restore through environmental justice issues, um, long-standing ethnic and racial tensions in that city, thinking about the environment, broadly speaking, as a ground on which we can stand and collectively through intersectional relationships start to figure this out. It opens with an essay by Bill McKibben talking about the Keystone battle, in which McKibben argues directly that a leadership movement, a leader-less movement may be more effective than a charismatic leader-led movement because it's dispersive and the analogy he draws is to distrib distributional energy, that is solar power on your roof, versus central utility plants regardless of their source of energy, whether it's oil, soil, or otherwise, one controls that and then distributes it to us in various ways. The other is we control on our rooftops as a way of gaining some kind of control over how and what we conserve over time. And it ends with Kyle White's piece about the um, DAPL, Dakota Access Pipeline, and the struggles of Native American communities and nations as they tried to confront uh, the building of that pipeline, like the Atlantic Pipeline in Virginia, like the pipelines all over the place, are now battlegrounds for lots of indigenous peoples as well as um, activists. The goal was to really sort of help my students and me figure out our place in the world and what it is we can do and what it, what it is that is less possible for us to do. But I think that's really important. So while I'm not convinced that all of these things that I've been telling you uh, will save the nation, let alone the West, I can tell you this with certainty. It saved me. Thanks very much.